things for a master's degree, or so it was okay, I'll pay for your master's degree to become a midwife, or you can go back to work and be just a regular floor nurse again. I was like, yeah, never mind. All right, so today I'm going to try to make it through the postpartum period. If I can't, I can't, no big deal. Chapter 16 has like two slides, but uh, there's not much to know. And most of the postpartum you already know because you learned it in postpartum hemorrhage class, okay? But uh, we're going we're gonna to finish birth and talk about high-risk birth and see if we can't make it into postpartum, okay? So we, when last we, we met, we were talking about um, the uh, presentation of the baby, ROP, ROA, ROT, that kind of stuff. And after I left, I went and did some looking, and I found that amazing uh, uh, set of pages about that I pulled out of Williams Obstetrics, and I posted them on Blackboard. If you haven't gotten them, please go get them. Okay, it's a very, very simple process. Okay, right or left, anterior or posterior, and then what is the presenting part? So over here, if your baby's, if the back of baby's head is over here in this part of mom's pelvis, she is left occiput um, anterior. If the butt, if the head is over here, left occiput posterior. Over here, right occiput anterior. Over here, right occiput posterior. Remember, this is your occiput, and this is your posterior. Okay? Mm -hmm. yep. So, so the the it has to be facing whatever... It is wherever the occiput is, exactly. Is it in the right or left side of the pelvis? Is it in the front or back side of the pelvis? Or is it in the middle, and that's called transverse? Okay? If they're coming down butt first, you change from, you change from occiput to sacrum. Okay, and then where is the sacrum? Right or left, anterior or posterior, whatever. And then finally, it is the, the other one is mentum, and that is the chin. Okay, if they're coming down chin first, and you're trying to remember uh, what, what is she, mentum anterior, mentum posterior, you're not going to see that as a generalist. Face presentations happen. They are incredibly rare, and they, 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 they luckily uh, um, will almost always resolve themselves, but babies do not look happy. They look like they did 12 rounds with Rocky Balboa. Gigantic bruised face from all the pressure on their face. It's awful. Um, yep. Okay, uh, so let's go to our slides. I'm sitting there going, there's something wrong. Something's missing. Oh, yeah, slides. So, we're going to talk about the signs and symptoms of impending labor. Now, books and most healthcare providers like to act as though... This happens for a minute or two, and then you go into labor. Or this happens for an hour or two, and then you go into labor. And so they differentiate these things from true labor versus false labor. That is not the way it works. Okay? The reality is, labor is not 22 minutes plus commercials. It does not have a defined start and stop. Okay? Labor is a, is, is, a, is a cumulative process. It gradually builds up over several weeks not over several minutes, okay? And women, there's a big joke in obstetrics, how do you know when a woman, how long a woman was in labor? Take whatever she says and divide it by two. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because it's, the, 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 the difference is what do I call labor versus what do women call labor, okay? Truthfully, what women call labor is far more accurate. It is a week or two, sometimes three or four, right? And Understanding, remember we talked about how, um, how, how it's not a sleep disorder that women have when they're pregnant? Yes. Okay, that their body is changing, it's an adaptation to pregnancy, the exact same thing happens. And so when you talk to women at 38, 39, 40 weeks, you'll hear them say the same thing over and over again. It seems like I can't sleep. Every night I get these, I got, I got contractions all night last night, and I was just sure I was going to go into labor and delivery, and then it just all went away at like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Or, I got this constant increased discharge. It's not a gush of fluid. It's not like I have to change my underwear. But it's really increased, especially at night when I'm contracting. Okay? <laughs> I get this anxious feeling. I can't sit still. My husband comes home. You know, we make dinner. And after dinner, I'm just busy all night. I can't do anything. But, but I'm just moving around. All the, you know, I'm cooking. I'm cleaning. I'm canning. I'm setting things up in the freezer. All of those are signs of labor. Okay? And what happens is, every night from dinner till breakfast, the body desperately tries to go into labor. Every night it says, please, 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 can I have a baby, please? 
And the baby goes, no, not tonight, loser. Maybe tomorrow. Okay? <laughs> and it happens over and over and over again every night. Okay? And so from about 5 or 6 o'clock in the evening until about midnight, sometimes 2 in the morning, the body will contract, have an increased vaginal discharge, an anxious, I can't sit still feeling, and it gets harder and harder to sleep. Okay? Every night for, you know, over and over and over again. Sometimes more impressive, sometimes less impressive, but every single night. And then somewhere around midnight, 2 o'clock in the morning, the body decides, look, it's not happening, never mind, I'm going back to bed. Or the baby goes, you know what, tonight, to this morning would be a pretty good time to have a baby. And the baby allows it to kick into high gear and you go into active labor. And so what we see in labor and delivery is every evening there's this parade of pregnant women hoping to be pregnant, or hoping to be delivering, and they come in and they're contracting like every five or six minutes, and it's not really too impressive, uh, but, or sometimes they're acting like they're losing their religion, you know, and it's only contracting like every five minutes, and we're like, oh, go home, way too early. And they go home, they walk, they have sex, whatever, they come back around nine, nine o'clock at night, we send them home. They come back around midnight, we send them home. They come back around two o'clock in the morning. If you come into labor and delivery at two o'clock in the morning, you're probably really in labor. <laughs> and most of those women get admitted, okay? Um, not because, you know, we're sick of seeing you, but because if your body has kept you awake that late into the day, the contractions are getting stronger and more powerful, it's probably going to turn into labor, okay? And so these are the signs of impending labor. Now let's see how the book likes to talk about it, okay? So the first thing that's going to happen is, if, you know, your baby is going to drop down into the pelvis. And when he drops into the pelvis, right around 36 weeks on a first-time mom, you get this thing called lightning. Okay, and lightning, it sounds like a bolt of lightning, but it's really everything gets lighter, okay? The baby drops into the pelvis, he descends to about minus one, minus two station, and all of a sudden the pressure goes away from the lungs, and mom can breathe, and she's like, oh! And anyone who's had a baby goes, yes, I know that feeling, okay? Second, third, fourth time moms, that happens at the very end. They don't get lightning until like 40 weeks, and all of a sudden, bang, they, light, they lighten and they deliver usually in the same day. Okay. Um, but they'll notice the breathing gets easier, they, start, they, they, they get more pelvic congestion, and they get this sense like I'm sitting on a bowling ball all the time. And that's the increased blood volume, increased pressure, increased urinary frequency, I mean, all that stuff is, is causing this big buildup of pressure in the pelvis with the baby's head and all the blood, going to make everything grow and stretch and get ready. You look like you had questions. No? Okay. No. I, I saw like... And then, uh, okay, other signs and symptoms every night. Increased contraction activity, cervical changes. How do you know if you're having cervical changes? Yet yeah, don't. Okay. You can't check your own cervix, and I have women do it from time to time, or dads will check the cervix. It's not like he hasn't been there before. That's kind of how they got here to see me in the first place. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about yes. the cervical changes. I know some people got the chance to, like, feel in there as far as when we were at clinical. I was on labor and delivery Friday, and I got to follow the triage nurse, and I'm sure there's a way to do it, but since I haven't done it, all she did was stick her, um, I think it was two fingers, mm -hmm. up the vagina, and she was, oh yeah, you five centimeter. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I was like, you're like, how on earth like, do you do that, right? right? Okay, so it's like the cocaine. It's it's it. it I mean, first she, thought, thing, she was literally in there for three seconds. Yeah, it doesn't take long. It's a dimension. Right? It doesn't take long. It jumps right out at you. What happened? So first of all, it's a far more gentle method than what you described, right? I usually put my hand on the thigh and say, "You're going to feel my touch." <laughs> then I use the back of my, my the back of my hand to kind of open the labia I mean, as I tr as I my fingers go in, go all the way in, usually about so deep, okay and sweep back to the back of the birth canal, okay? Um, in, like you're, like, you know, they've got the uterus is, is lying there, and you want to slip behind it this way, okay? In early labor, before they go into labor, the cervix is tucked up and out of the way, okay? It's not out in the front, because when it's out in the front, it'll get bumped into all the time, right? So the body keeps the cervix kind of tucked away most of the time. And so you know when someone is in labor, you reach in, and all of a sudden there's a big prominent cervix, okay? Because it rolls forward. So we start by going kind of back into the back of the pelvis, and we kind of sweep around and see if we can't find something in there. Okay? The cervix, especially in labor, tends to roll forward and then open and get real soft and thin. Okay? Now a woman who's five centimeters dilated, especially if it's her first baby, the cervix of the baby is about that far away. 
okay? You literally go just to the second knuckle and you bump into the baby's head because babies are, are so close. And so the head will be there and surrounding the head will be a, a ring of tissue, okay? And that ring of tissue is the cervix. So we go in, we find that ring of tissue and we put our fingers into it, we touch the baby on the head and we wanna see how far open is it, okay? And everybody has different hands. Your fingers are different than my fingers. And so for me, if it's real tight around one finger, it's about one centimeter dilated. If I can wiggle my finger around in that hole, but I can't get two fingers in, two centimeters dilated. If I can get three fingers, or two fingers side by side, three centimeters dilated, then four, then five, then six, and about seven is as far as I can stretch comfortably with my fingers. Then, if, then after that, I have to turn my hand sideways and go eight, nine, 10. Okay, so we're literally reaching in, finding the hole, and measuring how far open the hole is. Because it's basically the cervix opening around the head of the exactly. baby. Exactly, the cervix opens around the head and of the, the baby. The closer or the further the head goes along, obviously. The exactly, the more it opens. As they start here and they go like this, and they open up. Okay? So the big cervical change that happens early in labor is the cervix gets soft. And your book describes it as feeling like your earlobe. And it does, it's very buttery soft. It goes from nice and hard like your nose nice and soft like your earlobe, okay? And it becomes this fleshy just presence there. And then the baby starts to put pressure against it and make it dilate open, okay? Bloody show is part of the cervical changes. As the cervix changes, it bleeds a little bit. Just like if I took my finger and put it in your nose and yanked on your nose, your nose would bleed too. It's just a stretching mucous membrane. The same thing that you pull on the, on, on the mouth. Anytime you stretch a mucous membrane, you're going to get these little micro vessels that are going to break and bleed just a little bit. And so, but bloody show is kind of a blood mixed with mucus kind of thing. You just see like a, like a streak of blood mixed in the mucus in mom's underwear or whatever. And the, the moms are always coming in freaking out. I got a little bit. Like, well, have you been contracting? Yeah. Is it 9 o'clock at night? Yeah. Go away. It's okay. Of course, you have to do your safety things, right? Any risk of preterm, any risk of preterm labor, any risk of a, of a placenta previa, placental abruption, you know, you rule out all your badness, but understand that bloody show is a normal part of early labor, okay? So what's the difference between the, how do you, can you tell the difference between the plug? Mucus plug? The mucus plug, because I'm sure that had a little yeah. bit of blood. The mucus plug is the mucus that's mixed in with the blood. And so a mucus oh, plug, okay, yeah. okay. everyone thinks of the mucus plug as some strange entity. If you've ever had a cold, you've seen a mucus plug. You blow your nose, that's a mucus plug, okay? It's exactly the same in the cervix as it is in your nose, okay? Okay, so bloody show in this instance is the same as the mucus plug that we're talking about. Well, it's bloody show is blood mixed with the mucus plug, okay? Okay. Yeah. So it's just, you know, what, is, what does the mucus plug look like? It looks the same as when you blow your nose, okay? And what happens is as the cervix softens and opens, the mucus falls out. The plug that was being held in falls out. And sometimes you see an actual plug. Most of the time it just gets mixed in with this increased vaginal discharge that they have, and you never really see it. And women are always so excited. I lost my mucus plug last night. And I go, did you catch it? Did you find it? Did you bring it in? I need to see it. And they're like, what? No, I'm kidding. I don't care if you lost your mucus plug. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, I've gotten a lot of those. <laughs> Tom, is this normal? Yes, it's normal. Go back to bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, your mucus plug, it, it's a hopeful sign. It's a sign that labor is coming, okay, but not tonight. <laughs> Just coming sometime in the next week or so. Okay. Um, rupture of membranes? Well, yeah, that's definitely a, <laughs> a sign of labor, right? When the water breaks, labor comes shortly thereafter most of the time. Um, uh, most women, their water does not break. Only one-third of women will have their water rupture uh, spontaneously um, before the onset of labor or during labor. Everybody else, it happens at around seven or eight centimeters or when your provider breaks your water for you. Okay. And I like to call it releasing the water. I don't call it breaking the water because breaking is just too mean. It just sounds hard. I'm not breaking anything. I'm releasing your waters. Okay? <laughs> but certainly, rupture of membranes is a sign of early labor. Um, and and do you, the, the difficult thing that a lot of people struggle with is how do I know if it's a rupture of membranes or that increased vaginal discharge that I get every night? Okay? The difference is when your water breaks, it's 800 cc's of water okay? in a balloon that's pointing downward. What happens if you hold the balloon upside down and poke it in the bottom? 
gush, right? It runs down your legs, it fills up your socks, it makes a mess. Take a jar of pickles and throw it on the ground. That's what it looks like when your water breaks. Okay, it's a lot. If you just have this increased discharge, then it's probably just an increased discharge. Okay? It's sometimes hard to tell, and you don't know for sure until you take the sample and look at it under the microscope. But, no, you wouldn't taste it. No, that would be yucky. <laughs> don't you remember he said last Yeah, I talked about how amniotic fluid, fluid is very yeah. salty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Energy spurt. Every night, the body wants to get up and get moving. And they call it nesting, okay? Mm -hmm. But what it is, is birth is an active process. You are not designed to sit still on your butt and labor, okay? You have to walk. You ever notice pregnant women walk funny? Mm -hmm. You ever notice they walk like this? That waddle is on purpose. What is that doing to the baby inside my pelvis? It's rocking, it's rocking them, right? <laughs> Swinging them back and forth, helping them get momentum as he moves through the pelvis. Okay? So moms are forced every night to get up and walk. They can't sit still. They have to move. Okay? Every night. Helping that baby come through the pelvis over and over and over again. Now, walking does not induce labor. If walking induced labor, I'd put treadmills on labor and delivery. Walking does not induce labor, okay? Um, if you're in active labor, three, four, five centimeters, walking helps the baby move through the pelvis, and that will help labor come to an end. It finishes the process. It doesn't start the process. So I hear people go, that, that walking doesn't work. I walk three, four miles every day, and it doesn't do anything. And I go, yeah, that's, I could have told you that. Walking is a waste of time, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> you need to be contracted. I've wasted so many hours in my life. I know, I know, and everybody does. So the funny thing, my uh, when baby number eight was being born, we were in the uh, it was it was the end of the day, and I knew my wife's labor was coming. Okay, it's obvious when labor is coming, and you live with somebody. Okay, and so and I knew it was coming because every day at like three o'clock I get the same phone call. When are you coming home? I need you home. I need you home. When are you coming home? You're never home. When I need you. <laughs> okay, and that's because women draw people close to them when they need when they're going into labor. Humans are the, one of the few mammals that labor socially. Okay, we labor with people we love. And so women will find that they're anxious if they're alone and they're going into labor. And so for the last couple of days before they go into labor, part of that process is drawing people toward them and calling them and making them come close, okay? So they get their labor supports on the phone. My wife's an angry woman, and so she's always attacking. And she's always angry when she wants something done. And I'm like, I got you. It's okay. I understand. She's not mad at me. That's just how she expresses emotion. You should see her when she's running late. Same. You know? <laughs> but, uh... So, so she called me, she was calling me, I need you here, I need you here. So I left work and I came home and I was talking to her a little bit. She was talking about, yeah, I don't know, I'm not in labor. I'm just kind of crampy a little bit. You know, I was like, all right, well, let's go shopping. So we went to, we went to Target, or we went to um, Michael's. We went to Michael's and we were walking around Michael's. And we were walking around Michael's, it was about 6 o'clock in the evening. And she would walk and... You know, just over and over and over again. And I was like, oh, I know what's coming. So we finished Michael's, and we're leaving Michael's, and um, it was one of those big shopping centers, right, with all parking lots in the middle. And so we were leaving Michael's, and I was like, well, we've got to go to Target. Let's go to Target. Do you want to walk to Target, or do you want me to get the car, and we'll drive you to Target? And she goes, I don't know. This, whew, this walking seems to, like, make my contractions stronger. Seriously, bonehead? <laughs> I said, honey, that's kind of the therapeutic effect we're going for here. Said, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Okay, fine, I'll walk. And we got to Target and said, nope, I'm not going in. Let's go to the hospital. <laughs> this is a, that was all it took, was that walk and get things moving. It was about 7 o'clock, and Dorothy was born at like 8.15. So it wasn't very hard. It's baby number eight. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They move kind of fast. Fall out on the way. Yeah. <laughs> Which would have been perfectly yeah, okay. You, you would have pulled over. Yeah, I would have pulled over. Right? <laughs> and I always say, if the baby falls out before you get to me, you clearly didn't need my help anyway. But we wanted to do a water birth, so we had to get to the hospital to do a water birth. We had never had one of those. And that was fun. Yeah. I was thinking weird stuff, but yeah. I meant like... We do a lot of weird stuff. We love to experiment. Yeah. I mean, you had a lot of... Obviously, you <laughs> think <laughs> Another important one is GI disturbances, okay? Whatever stimulates the uterus to contract causes an awful lot of diarrhea, okay? 
So three or four days before baby's born, women will notice they get diarrhea. And they come and they complain about, I'm having this diarrhea, what can I do to stop it? I say, have a baby. Okay. <laughs> And what happens is it's the same thing. It's, it's why Cytotec makes the uterus contract, because it's a GI drug. Um, but the same thing that gives the uterus that increased energy and burst of contraction also has an effect on the bowels. And it empties the bowels. And what a wonderful thing, right? right? Because if they empty the bowel, they make all kinds of room in there, more room for the baby to come down, and less likely they're going to poop on me. They still do. Almost everybody poops on me anyway. But most women have a fairly empty a set of bowels when they go into labor. So that GI <coughs> disturbance is, uh, is really diarrhea, and it happens for three or four nights before they go into bed. And then, like I said, not able to sleep at night. So you spend a lot of time napping during the day and being awake at night because birth is a nighttime process. So true labor versus false labor. I cross that out. I call it pro <laughs> labor versus active labor, okay? Because how awful is it as a woman to be told you're in false labor? Yeah. It sure feels real to me, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing false about it. They're actively contracting. They're working through the early part of labor. But because you know books are written by old men 50 years ago, they like to quantify and put things into different orders and set things up that way. And so they were saying, well, if it's not active labor, it has to be false labor. Not understanding it's called prodromal labor, early labor. That's zero to four centimeters labor, okay? The part that can last for weeks labor, okay? So it's prodromal. Now, true labor, people always say, well, okay, fine. If birth is this long spectrum from zero to ten, and it can take weeks for it to happen, how do you, how do you know when to admit somebody to the hospital? How do you know when they've hit that point of no return? Okay? And there is, a, there is a, a, an agreed upon um, uh, definition, and that is active, powerful contractions with cervical dilation, generally speaking, more than four centimeters dilated. Okay, four centimeters is that mythical cutoff into active labor. Okay, so it's contractions that lead to dilation and effacement of the cervix. That's that's the that's labor. Okay, in its simplest terms. But what happens is, so that means when they go from zero centimeters to two centimeters, they're in active labor. No, they're in labor. They're just not in active labor yet. They haven't met admission criteria yet. They don't need attention yet. They're just in that prodromal warm-up labor, actively contracting, having cervical change. Okay? What's that? Okay. So more about it. False labor. False labor is that prodromal labor we're talking about is when women have a lot of contractions and no cervical change. And that really does break a lot of hearts. Boy, I make people cry with that one all the time. They're rocking and rolling contractions for two or three days, and you check their cervix, and their cervix is like a bottlenose dolphin, hard and closed and very frustrating. Um, my best friend's wife on baby number four, she started having active, painful contractions at 28 weeks pregnant. And she continued to contract every three to five minutes for 12 straight weeks. Yep. Once in a while, you medicate. You, when they can't stand it anymore, you put them to sleep. <laughs> yeah, you give them some morphine rest. You give them 10 milligrams of morphine IM, and they sleep for a while. Or you give them like Benadryl and Ambien and you know that kind of thing, just to kind of knock them out and let them get a little rest. Yes, ma'am. Do they have to, if they're contracting like that so often, do they stay at the hospital? No, they go home. Yeah. Yep. And no dilation? Yeah, they don't dilate. Would they get nagging using the <coughs> No, no, not that one. Because she was, it was, it was. There are some tests that we run to see if it's preterm labor or not. Right. And when all those tests come back negative, That's then you know it's just preterm contractions for no good reason. We say do whatever it is that makes you contract more. Don't do that. So if you're contracting, rest, and it makes it better, then rest. Okay. If resting doesn't make it better, then don't bother resting. Okay. But uh, it's just, we don't know why it happens. The body just gets into these mean cycles. Usually it's only for a couple of days. It's called prolonged latent phase. And it's just it's zero to four centimeters takes forever instead of a, 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 you know, a, a prescribed two or three. <coughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. So based on this, and obviously since I've never had a child, um, so when I have a child, is that from the very beginning all the way to right before you deliver the baby, 
contractions don't get any worse or less. It's just the duration of them increases. Is that what that means? So the, the uterus is a muscle, and it's actively exercising. Usually from about 20 weeks until birth, it's contracting every single day. Okay, getting and those contractions get stronger, closer together, more intense as you get closer to it. And I always use the analogy of running a marathon. Nobody wakes up one day and runs a marathon, right? They train for months before they run a marathon. And the uterus is doing the same thing. It's getting stronger every 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 night when it's contracting. Okay, and those are normal. Those are what they call those Braxton Hicks. Okay, and the difficulty is always trying to decide. Well, is that a Braxton Hicks contraction? Is that a prodromal labor contraction? Or is that an active labor contraction? And it's really hard to know, especially over the phone. It's impossible to know. Okay, um, and so I always just call them all contractions. And there are contractions that are going to do labor, and there are contractions that aren't going to do labor. Okay, and um, so when we talk about like these, they, they 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 tend to get stronger. They tend to get closer together as labor as birth uh, comes. Well, I don't necessarily mean false labor. I just mean contractions in general. Uh huh. But the, okay, never mind. Okay. I just, it, I'm sorry. There you go. Because all contractions are contractions, and they all have the same goal in mind get the baby out. They start with exercising, and then they go to the real event. Okay? Now, um, your book talks about the, 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 the prodromal labor contractions tend to stop with activity. That if you're, uh, if you're contracting and you get up and you walk around, prodromal labor contractions will go away. Uh, yeah, sort of, but not really. What really happens is the body eventually gives up and stops contracting. Okay. So, admission. So, we have decided. It's, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. This mom has been bugging you for three weeks straight. She finally meets admission criteria, whatever your admission criteria happens to be. Four to five centimeters dilated, actively contracting, requiring pain medicine, whatever, water broken, it doesn't matter. But we're admitting her to labor and delivery, okay? So when you admit somebody, though, obviously you want to establish a positive relationship. Remember that uh, the, the um, what was her name? Donna was talking about, oh, she's got a, bur oh, no, it was, uh, it was Doris Ann. Oh, she's got a birth plan, you know you're going to cut her, right? That is not establishing a positive relationship. Okay. It's all about, like, whenever I'm admitting somebody, I tell people, how wonderful, today is the day. You've been waiting for this since the pee hit the stick. How amazing. <laughs> this is it. You've been waiting for this all year. I've known you. You've been coming to see me all month. You were dreaming about this moment. How wonderful that we get to do this together. Okay? Uh -oh. I always, everything's, you'll never hear me say a negative thing about labor. Never. I absolutely love labor, every minute of it, because it's such an amazing process. And it makes people, these superhuman gods, they're amazing. So, establishing a positive relationship. I'm your nurse, we're going to have a beautiful baby together. Tell me about your baby, what's her name, you know, how much do you think your baby weighs. Asking fun, friendly questions, okay? Making a new best friend. Because I promise you, they will remember you forever, okay? The people who came out and helped at the Greek Fest, they saw it happen a couple times. A couple of people came up, Tom, I was your invention. We had a baby together. Yeah. So they always remember you. Everywhere I go, I run into a pregnant a woman who had a baby. Yeah. At least six times Yeah. I'll teach you how to do this. Exactly. So yeah, so so they remember you. They remember you and hopefully they should remember you in a positive way, right? Because this is a positive moment in their life. Collecting your admission data, your age, your G's and P's, your blood type, your labs, you know, the standard questions that all that all nurses ask with that six page admission uh, packet about how do you learn best, you know. <laughs> My favorite answer to that, how's your best, how do you learn best? A patient wrote interpretive dance. <laughs> so get on it. <laughs> um, now, the difference between a labor admission and an admission to the med surgery floor is that we're very focused in labor, okay? I don't care about your great-grandmother's heart disease, okay? That has nothing to do with me. I got a real, I got a focused thing to take care of right now, and if it's not between the nipples and the knees and female, I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me at all. That is very use, very unimportant data. So our, our admissions assessment is very focused on making, it, um, making the birth process, the labor process, as safe and effective and wonderful as we possibly can. Psychological, psychosocial assessments are important. 
things like um, how do you, you know, um, um, you know, are you safe at home? Um, how do you and your husband get along? Where is your husband? Is he deployed? Does he, is he a crossroad trucker? Um, what kind of support are you going to have at home? Do you have all the things you need at home for your baby? Do you have a crib? Do you have a, you know, sheets and blankets and that kind of stuff? Have you made arrangements? Those are the psychosocial assessments. Cultural assessments, my, cultural assessments are tricky, okay? Because you say, well, you know, of course, well, if you're cultural, Hispanic women labor this way and Arab women labor this way. Is that true? No. no. So a cultural assessment isn't really a cultural assessment, okay? What you're really saying is, what kind of labor are you looking for? What do I need to know to support you in the best way possible? Okay? And I have not found an awful lot of folks who say by the color of their skin that they're going to labor this way. Okay? They don't go, well, you know, I'm really interested in this, but I'm Hispanic, so therefore I have to yell and scream like a mad woman when I'm in labor. It doesn't work like that. Yes, ma'am. Um, I remember like, reading the book, it said something about how like, you're supposed to document how the woman like, wants to labor, mm -hmm. labor's best, if that makes sense. But don't you, isn't it true that like, your wife labored differently for each child, or mm -hmm. for, like, right? So, right. like, what works for one child may not work for this child. So, exactly. how are you supposed to document, like, if they're in labor, it may work now, but it may not work in five minutes. Sure, sure. So, so how do you document What that? we usually say is, you've had other babies, what have you done in the past that you found useful? What did you like or dislike about your other births? That's a good way to start, okay? Um, another, now, there, there are some cultural phenomenon that tend to hold, tr hold true. Um, my favorite is that women who... Um, who are born and raised in Cape Verde, deliver standing up. I've never met a Cape Verdean woman yet who would lie down in bed. Okay. Now, if you guys aren't familiar with Cape Verde, it's a little island off the west coast, I think, of Africa. It's a little itty bitty little teeny tiny little place. But where I did my midwifery school, most of my patients were from Cape Verde. So all my patients stood up at the side of the bed and I sat on the floor and delivered the babies. Okay. What's that? Like they broke what we learned. You know how we. Well, no, we, they just stood there. Like, they would just be on the bed like this and go, ah, and then, okay, ah, just like that. <laughs> and they would just, yeah. And so, but that was, that was as close to a cultural phenomenon as I've really been able to, like, that's like as close to monolithic as it gets, okay? Um, but when we talk about cultural assessment, what we're really looking for is, and with the way I describe it to patients, is tell me about your fantasy childbirth. If you could do anything you wanted, what would it be? If you need me to do anything at all, what is it? I am literally your slave for the next 12 hours. Beat me to death. I'll do whatever you want. Okay? I don't care. Okay? You can swing naked from trapeze. You can roll around in the dirt. You can get an epidural. You can lay in the bed. You can be in the shower. You can be in a tub. I don't care what you want to do. What do you need me to do? I always joke that I'm too old to do backflips. But I'll gladly have my intern do back lips for you if you want me to. <laughs> and I'll okay, okay, intern dance. <laughs> Interns are so fun because they'll do anything to make you happy. But so you do your assessment. What do you need from me? Okay, whatever it happens to be, go for it. Okay, and then lab tests. We run as as the standard of care is that all admit all laboring women get a type and screen and a CBC at the minimum. That's pretty much standard everywhere. Some places do more. They do urine drug screens, they do hepatitis screens, they repeat the syphilis exam, the RPR value. They, um, they'll run PTs, PTTs, they'll run liver function tests, they'll run chemistry panels, you know, just like anywhere else. There's, provide, there's preferences based on that particular environment, what they have going on. But as a general rule, everybody gets a CBC and a type and screen. Why? Okay, what does the CBC tell us? Okay, hemoglobin's one of them. What else? Like iron levels is complicated. Okay, not iron levels. That's a TIBC. Um, so, but hemoglobin's one, right? What else is there? Hematocrit is the other, right? White blood cells, sure. And? Platelets. Okay, those are the big ones, okay? The, CB, the, the hemoglobin, hematocrit, white blood cells, and platelets. Now, almost all, white, almost all women in labor have an elevated white blood cell count. We pretty much ignore the white blood cell counts in labor. Okay. Just like marathon runners in the middle of a marathon would have a high white blood cell count too. Just because you're working hard. Okay? So we do a CBC. And then what about a type and screen? Why a type and screen? Okay. For blood loss because we're gonna we want to plan for what? Well yeah, we want to plan for hemorrhage, we want to be able to give them a blood transfusion. Does a type and screen enable you to give a blood transfusion? 
No. You need another test. What's that? What did you say? Cross match. Okay. I type in cross. Okay. So a type in screen is a screening for antibodies, and what they do is they run your blood, they do a type and screen, they look for the various antibodies in your blood, and they go, do I have blood in my, in my bank that matches that, or do I need to order blood from somewhere else with these particular antibodies? It's just kind of setting it up, okay? A cross match, it says, okay, they want a cross match, and they want two units of blood, I'm gonna take unit 17 and unit 44 and send them up there, because those are the ones that match the best, okay? So when we talk about a type in screen, it's just a warning. Hey, by the way, we might be admitting, we might be giving blood to this person. A cross match means send me blood, however much I ask for. Type and cross for two units is the usual start. Okay. But that's what the lab tests are for, and those are the most common ones. First phase of labor. Now, labor is broken down in four stages. First stage, second stage, third stage, fourth stage. What is first stage? Latent. Well, latent is a piece of first stage. It's right there. There's latent phase, active phase, uh, transition phase, and that's from zero to ten centimeters is first stage of labor. Okay, that's the cervical dilating portion of labor. Okay, so um, and it it starts when we talk about zero. We don't mean right now you're all in labor because all of your cervixes are zero dilated. Mm -hmm. It means the first change from zero. Okay. So they're actively contracting and they're starting to get cervical changes. That's the beginning of latent phase of labor, okay? And latent phase of labor, um, a wonderful analogy for labor, um, if you look at Friedman's curve, you guys look in your book and you see Friedman's curve? I see your book happens to be open to it, okay? There's this, there's this hill, it kind of goes like this, it kind of comes up a little bit, and it takes off, and then it kind of plateaus, right? What page is that? 433. 433, okay? So latent phase, if you were gonna, if that were a mountain, Okay, when you drive to a mountain, before you get there, for like the last 50 miles before the mountain, you go through foothills, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of up and down, a wind, winding curves, that kind of thing. And that's latent phase. It goes up and down, the cervix is slowly changing, you're gradually gaining elevation, okay? Active phase is when you hit that massive slope going almost straight up, okay? And as a general rule, it's between four and 10 centimeters, is that active phase. It's gonna take off like a rocket, okay? On first time moms, it runs at about 45 degree angle, about a centimeter every hour and a half or so. Second, third, fourth time moms, it's five centimeters in two hours or so. It goes straight up, okay? So the active phase is the point of maximum slope when the cervical change changes, change cervical dilation changes drastically. And then there's the transition phase. If you look at your curve, you'll see at the very end, it kind of slows down a little bit and it goes almost flat for a little. And that's transition. We talked about this in the non-farm support class that between eight and nine centimeters, a lot of women will fall asleep in labor, okay? Where they actively contract, oh, 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 and then, and they get incredibly relaxed and calm and the contractions space out. And that's a chance for the body to take a break before time starts pushing, okay? Gives it a chance to build up some more energy, okay? So that's latent phase, active phase, transition phase, okay? And then, like I said, Friedman's curve. Now, Friedman's curve was a statistical model created by Friedman 50, 60 years ago. It was changed recently um, to, be, to be much more dramatic after six centimeters. So now, more and more, and I think in your career, they're going to start saying active phase starts at six centimeters, especially in the second time model. Because mm -hmm. the second, third, fourth time model will hang out at three, four, five centimeters for weeks and not be in labor. They're just, their cervix is ready to go. But once it crosses six, boy, things take off fast. Okay? Point of no return. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's that rocket right there. Okay, by the way, I love this. Notice this, the difference here? So here, for the primate, she hits four centimeters here. What's that? 215? And she hits 10 centimeters at 5 o'clock, 5.30. Okay, so three or four hours, about a centimeter an hour. The malt hip mom, she hits four centimeters here at 10.15, 10.30, and she delivers at 11.45 an hour and 15 minutes later, mm -hmm. okay? Wicked quick. But the labor process itself, the active labor process is pretty darn fast, 
Okay, from four to ten, we're talking six to ten hours is pretty darn is pretty common. Okay, about a centimeter an hour even in a first time mom. Now the second stage can be lengthy. So in, so nursing care. When you've got a woman in, in, in active labor from zero to 10 centimeters, it's all about comfort and support and helping them to move through. You guys learned an awful lot about this in your class. It's, it's ongoing assessment. You're just facilitating comfort and making the birth experience as wonderful as possible. Spending an awful lot of time advocating. Here in America, we're getting to where birth is both a performance art and an argument at the same time. As though you need to protect your patient against her provider because those mean, evil providers are so mean to people. And that's not really the case, but they do tend to be bullies, okay? We have a bad habit in obstetrics of saying my way is the only way, and informed consent is, this is what I'm going to do to you, please sign and give me permission. And that's not really facilitating a birth experience. So a lot of times the nurse can be the advocate and say, you know, doctor, you say you want to break her water, but she really doesn't want her water broken. Is there an alternative? Is there something else we can do instead? Okay? Or you say you want to start Pitocin, but she would like to do something a little bit more natural. Maybe we can do some nipple stimulation or get in a shower or do something like that to encourage a more natural process. Okay? Just kind of keeping people honest, being the, re the referee, so to speak, between the family and the, and the facility. Okay? And it's just story guidance. I love Doris Ann's answer, how much longer? And what does she always say? Give me 30 more minutes. Quick, throw the clock away, break it. Just give me 30 more minutes. Don't ask for time. 30 more minutes, that's all I need. Just give me 30 minutes. Anticipatory guidance. People always ask me, when is the baby gonna come? When do I think the baby's gonna be born? I go, well, you're a first time mom. They change about a centimeter every hour and a half. So that's like, you got four centimeters to go. So that's three, six more hours. And you're gonna push for two hours, so eight hours. So eh, 10.30, 10 o'clock. Okay, anticipatory guidance. Or the other one I do a lot is to warn dad about transition. I forgot to mention transition. Transition phase between seven and eight centimeters is the most impressive thing you will ever see in a laboring, in any woman, but especially a laboring woman. Has anybody remember their transition phase? Anybody remember seven centimeters dilated? Anybody here do natural childbirth? Nope. Okay. Do you remember that point where the contractions were coming every two to th every two minutes? They lasted for a minute and a half. It seemed like they never go away, mm -hmm. and you're just like you have like an out of body experience. Mm -hmm. That's transition. Okay. Moms get really impressive. They're like, <laughs> and they and they and they, it's really powerful moment. Luckily, it's a short moment. Okay. It feels yeah, I, like six years. I mean, I have six years. Yeah. <laughs> they do. They, they can't breathe. They can't get themselves. They can't focus. They can't get in control. And most women who are doing natural childbirth who end up changing and go to an epidural, that's when they break. Okay? They get to seven centimeters. It's really, I can't do this anymore. It's so powerful. It can't possibly get worse than this. You know? And it can't. That's, that's as tough as it gets. But and I that's where. Pushing an epidural. Yeah. Like, they sure do. Whenever, and you'll be no yeah. pain. And I'll be like, yeah. this? What I tell people is, when you go, when you get admitted, say, never mention the word epidural to me. I don't want it. I don't care. I might change my mind later. I get it. But the more you offer the, offer the epidural, the easier it is to break, right? They go, okay, I understand. You want natural childbirth, and I totally get that, and I'm, I'm with you 100%. We're going for natural childbirth. But know that anesthesia is here anytime, and it's available if you want it. But I know you don't want it, but just know it's available. How about now? Because you know he's going for a C-section. He may not be available in the next half hour. Maybe you want one now just in case. No, okay, fine. How about now? Because you know it's really impressive and I just don't know. And what are they doing? It's like offering crack to a crack addict. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. They don't need the temptation. They gave it. Okay? And so they do. They're like, I know you don't want any more crack, but you know, just know that I have crack just in case you want it. Okay? Yeah. And you know, I know you don't want any crack. That's fine. But I've got it if you want it. Okay? How about now? Okay, they'll break. Okay, it's torturous to women who are trying to do natural childbirth yeah. to keep offering that. And I tell them on admission, know that I have a huge tool bag from narcotics to natural childbirth to epidural. I can do all kinds of amazing things. And I will never ask you what you want. Okay, you will tell me. I'll say, how are you doing? If you're strong, life is good, wonderful. Not so strong, need a little help, fine. You know, let's talk about that. But I don't mention those things. I just say, we're just, I'm going to pretend they don't exist until you ask for it. Okay? And if you ask for it, fine. 
What's that? Yeah, I know, right? Oh, I know. I hear it all the time. And women get so mad. <laughs> like, I told you, no! <laughs> but that's transition. And it's, um, it's a period of incredible stress on a laboring woman. And luckily, blissfully, it's, it's relatively short. It feels like it's much longer than it is, but it's blissfully short. And what I tell dads, this is part of my anticipatory guidance, is there's going to come a time when she's having powerful contractions. Every two minutes, they seem like they never go away. And she's having an out-of-body experience. And she might yell, she might scream, she might sing, she might do all kinds of amazing things. And no matter what happens, she might, even, she might vomit, she might do all kinds of crazy stuff, and it, you're not going to be right. Okay? <laughs> and when that happens, I'm going to come in with the biggest smile in the world on my face, because that's transition. Okay? And I love it, because that's change. That's mm -hmm. progress. That's we're moving to the next step. And it's wonderful. I'll give you all kinds of tools when the time comes. But just know it's going to happen. Okay? Yeah. And that's anticipatory guidance. It prepares them for it. Okay? So now with my husband, when I was going through that core, I was obviously I was breathing heavier. And it's like being, ooh. And he was like, shh. I looked and I was like, don't you shush me now. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, don't you ever. And I swear that gave me the energy just go, bop. And then yep. like, I... Past the yeah. head and it was just like, That's it, yep. You yep. know? Sorry, but it was just kind of like... Yeah, and that is an impressive time, and moms do some pretty impressive things during that time. Okay? I never call it screaming, I always call it singing. You do, you're okay? just like, you know, you, yep. you, yeah. sorry. And that was, you were singing your labor song. Oh, yeah. That was your labor song. Okay? Now, there are cultures where, where, where being quiet and being stoic is very highly prized. And I see, I see it a lot of with, with Korean women, that they just sit there, and they're banging it out, boy. They just bang, bang, bang. And they're just like. It's a little discomfort. Yeah. And I'm like, you are a superwoman. And then with, with baby number eight, we were, we were in the bathtub. We were in the tub, and my wife was on her knees, and she went, oh. How? And she leaned back and then went Dorothy right out into the water. <laughs> and then for the next three days, every time she saw any of my friends who were there, I'm so sorry for making so much noise. You said, oh, wow. That was it. There was no noise, but she felt like she was just embarrassed. Oh, personal hygiene. Remember we talked about increased vaginal discharge? Yeah. We talked about water breaking. We talked about pooping, right? And people tend to sit in one place. So if you're a laboring woman, actively leaking stuff out of your birth canal, do you want to sit in that cesspool for hours? No. So we practice personal hygiene over and over and over again in birth. It's a messy, bloody experience. And it's very important as a nurse to constantly be washing, changing sheets, changing pads. We go through so many chucks in labor and delivery, it's not funny. Okay? Yes? So th but that's the part that you don't weigh. Right, that's, right, right. That's, that's just water. Okay. That's not blood loss. Okay. Right? We're just cleaning well, it up. Because it looks the but same. It's awful because that's a wonderful nidus for infection. Okay? Mm. You come in, a woman's got a fever, and you look between her legs, and you're like, oh, when was the last time you changed anything out? Oh, it's been hours. Okay? Well, that's just bacteria. So personal hygiene is very important. Okay? Now, fetal assessment. Fetal assessment is difficult. We need a break before we get into fetal assessment. Go take 10 minutes. We're going to come back and talk about fetal assessment. I'm doing a virtual lactation consult. So. I saw that on Facebook. Yeah. 
Yep. I, understand. I got on FaceTime last night with a friend, and so we were like, so Dad was holding the camera and walking me through the things and looking at the latch and listening to all the, the sounds baby was making. And so today she's texting me every time she knows this. Well, I did this, and this worked, and I tried that, and that worked, and let's try this, and that wasn't so good. It's fun. All right, so then you don't have it, then I need to know what I need to do with my group. Like, we have it, my race and first so, if I need to get them to look at what they're doing, that's fine. What I don't like is when autonomy is like being threatened and being jeopardized. That's what I don't like. Well, there's a must understand another thing, too. Is that. Because if that was the case, they should have told me that from the beginning. 75? Seriously? Can we go to 72? 72 is like being in the freezer? Oh, she needed a brand. So, she ran before. Yeah. Yeah. 
or externships? Did you guys get that information, Dr. Goins? How thorough is the evidence behind that? About internships <laughs> or externships? <laughs> <laughs> he needed it last week yes, before 3 o'clock, and I remembered it today. I'm going to say, that happened last week. Like this past summer? Yeah. Oh, oh. All right, let's get started. So they can say. We got fun stuff now. Thank you. So, <clears throat> I have a love-hate relationship with fetal monitoring. And so we're going to do our best to cover it. Wait, are we playing? Are we recording? What are we doing? I don't know. I just we're recording. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you got to record. You got to record. You got to record. So, fetal assessment. The, the, the book makes it sound like you can only hear the baby's heartbeat if you line up directly between the chest or behind between the shoulder blades. That's not really the case. It's a pulse, just like anywhere else. There are radial pulses, femoral pulses, car uh, carotid pulses. You know, you can hear the fetal heartbeat in several different places. It is strongest between the chest, in, in, if you line up here, or between the shoulder blades. Um, but it doesn't really matter. Um, now, as a general rule, you're a labor and delivery nurse, you're hooking someone up, and you can't find any heart tones down low in the pelvis, but you find them way up here, that you want to make sure that patient's not breech, okay? That the baby's heart isn't accidentally up here, and it should be down there, okay? But, um, but it, that's, that's, that's by far not a, a hard and fast rule. So it doesn't really matter what position, but if you do your layup holds, you run down the body, you identify the back, and you listen most of the time, you'll hear the heartbeat nicely between the chest, between the, uh, yeah, right here, or between the shoulder blades, okay? So you line up on one side of the uterus or the other so that you send the beam through here. Understanding that your, your Doppler that you're listening with is like a flashlight. It sends a beam of, of energy in this direction, okay? So you aim it to shoot through here. If you aim it to shoot through the leg, you're probably not going to hear a heartbeat very well, okay? But if you can shoot it at the heart, you'll hear the heartbeat better, okay? But the reality is you put that Doppler wherever you can get the best sound. Almost always it's in the right and left lower quadrants, okay? Now, heart town tones. Um, now, the interesting thing about, um, about the heartbeat, okay, what is it that makes your heartbeat speed up or slow down? What is it? Not adrenaline. There are systems in your heart, in your body. One speeds things up and one slows things down. Sympathetic and parasympathetic, right? And do you remember which one the sympathetic does what? Okay, it, makes, it speeds things up, right? And the parasympathetic slows things down, right? I always remember that because paratroopers fall. 
So parachuters go down. So parasympathetic is going to slow everything yes. down, right? Yeah. So there's this constant battle in your body between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. One is speeding the heart rate up and the other is slowing it down back and forth, right? Same thing happens in babies. But because babies are a little bit more immature neurologically than we are, there's a much more broad um, range between the upper and lower on a baby, okay? So if you put a grown-up on a continuous pulse ox, you won't see a straight line, you'll see a little line, like a little variability all the time, okay? Um, but if you put a baby on there, that line is much bigger, and the range is between 10 and 15 beats per minute from second to second, okay? And that's called variability, right there, variability. A healthy baby with an intact sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system who's getting plenty of oxygen through his placenta, has a nice bumpy heart rate that kind of stays, it, it bounces five to 10 beats above and below a baseline at all times, okay? And we measure variability um, by what's called a baseline. We set a baseline and that is the average fetal heart rate over a 10 minute period without counting in ax cells or D cells, okay? Now that is a very important thing to understand. The baseline is the average fetal heart rate over a 10 minute period without factoring in ax cells or D cells. Okay? Can I say that again? Please, one more time. That the baseline is the average fetal heart rate over a 10 minute period without fa factoring in ax cells or D cells. Okay? With fetal heart rate monitoring, you don't know anything until you have a baseline, okay? Because everything after that changes from the baseline. So the first thing you do when you look at a fetal heart rate is you establish the baseline, which is the average fetal heart rate over a 10 minute period without factoring in ax cells or D cells. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> So once you've established your baseline, then you can tell what the variability is, whether he's having ax cells or having D cells. The variability is the bumpiness that you see, okay? And if you look at your pictures in your book of fetal heart rate, you'll see there's bumpiness. If you can imagine trying to go from every change, from every up to every down, and every down to every up, and putting a number next to that change, that's the variability, okay? So um, I'll get to it when I get to the pictures. But it's the actual change from the highest point to the lowest point. Again, not counting, very, not counting D cells, right? But it's the degree of change from upper to lower and lower to upper as it goes through the process. And it's, re it's, it's, it's measured um, in four types. There's absent variability, minimal variability, moderate variability, and marked variability, okay? The most important one to know is moderate variability. Okay? Moderate variability is a range from 6 to 24 beats per minute. Okay? 6 to 24 beats per minute, I'm sorry, 6 to 25 beats per minute is moderate variability. All right? Now the reason moderate variability is the most important is because from there you can figure out all the rest. Okay? So if if you've got minimal, okay, you start with absent. What does absent mean? None, right? So what is absent variability? How many beats per minute? Zero, okay? It is a flat line, okay? That's absent variability. It looks like asystole, just a straight line running across the, straight, the screen, okay? Then there's minimal variability. Well, you know it's less than marked, or less than moderate, but you know that it's more than absent, right? So if moderate is 6 to 25, what is less than 6? Okay, and what is more than 0? So 1 to 5 beats per minute is minimal variability. Okay, as a general rule, if you're looking on the tracing paper that we have in labor and delivery, and you see pictures of it in your book, each of the little blocks is 10 beats. So minimal variability is less than half of a block is being used by the bumpiness. Okay? But it's one to five beats per minute is moderate variability. Then of course, I'm sorry, it's minimal variability. Then of course it's moderate, and that's a six to 25. Mm -hmm. Now we're above that is marked variability. How would you define marked variability? Greater than 25 beats per minute, right? Okay, and that's the thing is going crazy all over the place. And you see that right before the baby is born. 
Okay? It's usually a sign the baby's making rapid progress through the pelvis. They'll get a period of marked variability. Okay? So that's variability. Absent, mineral, minimal, moderate, and marked. Okay? As a general rule, a baby is most healthy, or it proves that he's most healthy when he has moderate variability. Okay? If he has minimal variability or absent variability, we're very worried about him. Okay? It doesn't mean he's dying. It just means he's failed that test, and we need to do more looking. Okay? Most babies spend most of the time in moderate variability. And then there's accelerations. Another one of those definitions you absolutely need to understand. Accelerations are a visibly apparent rise in the fetal heart rate greater than 15 beats per minute, lasting for 15 seconds or more. It is a visibly apparent rise in the fetal heart rate greater than 15 beats per minute, lasting for 15 seconds or more. Visibly apparent becomes very important when you're talking about X cells and D cells. Okay? So, for at least 15 seconds? Yep, lasting 15 seconds and rising 15 beats above the baseline. So if you set your baseline at 135, mm -hmm. it's not an X cell until it crests 150. Okay? And from the beginning of the X cell to the end of the X cell has to be 15 seconds or more. Okay? Not that it stays 15 beats above the, axel, the baseline for 15 seconds, but from the beginning of the rise to the end of the rise is 15 seconds or more. Okay? And your book has examples of these things. Okay? Now, the next one is decelerations. Decelerations are complicated. You could literally write your PhD thesis on decelerations. There are uh, three types. Well, there are several types. Um, the most common are variables, earlies, and lates. All right? So, well, let's start with an early. An early D cell is a visibly apparent decrease in the fetal heart rate that begins, nadirs, and ends with the beginning, peak, and end of the contraction. So it's with the contraction. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but very important, visibly apparent decrease in the fetal heart rate that begins, nadirs, and ends with the beginning, peak, and end of the contraction. They tend to mirror the contraction, okay? As the contraction goes up, the D cell goes down, and the two match in the middle, okay? Like the nadir of the D cell, exactly, they're opposite each other. It's like a, D, a contraction, and then an opposite contraction upside down on top, okay? They tend to run like this, perfectly in line with each other, okay? And it's important, visibly apparent, Okay? Because you're going to see the heart rate's doing crazy stuff all the time. And then all of a sudden it'll go. Boom. Okay? And it's that drop with the contraction is an early D cell. Now, early D cells are not harmful. Okay? Early D cells are a sign of head compression. They're a sign that the baby is being squeezed through the pelvis. And it probably, most of the time, it means mom needs to push. Okay. Another thing that it means, and you almost always see this on a test, is that mom, the baby is occiput posterior. Okay. Why would a baby who's occiput posterior have an early D cell during every contraction? Because his head's being squeezed, right? Because those OP babies are trying to put a big part of their head through a small, through a, a narrow opening, and, and it's a tighter fit, and so they get squeezed more with their head as they're going through. But it's a sign that the head is being squeezed either because they're plus one, plus two station and they need to push, or because they are uh, being, um, being squeezed early on. Oh, 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 I forgot something. Visibly apparent, gradual onset. I forgot that part. So an early deceleration is a visibly apparent, gradual onset, decrease in the fetal heart rate that begins, ends, and, uh, begins peaks and ends, or natives and ends with the beginning, peak, and end of the contraction. So it's a gradual onset, meaning greater than 15 to 30 seconds as it comes down. Okay? It's not straight down, it's a gradual decrease. Okay? You use the word nadirs? Nadir. Nadir. Nadir means the lowest point of the D cell. It's the D cell's lowest number. So they're cruising around in 130s and they drop down to 90 and they come back up. 90 is the nadir. 
N A D I R. Okay? That's a tricky one. Now, there's a variable D cell. Variable D cells are V shaped for variable. V shaped, okay? They are a visibly apparent, abrupt decrease in the fetal heart rate irrespective of contraction. Okay? Visibly apparent, abrupt onset decrease in the fetal heart rate. Okay? So they're cruising along nicely, and instead of a kind of drop, it's cruising along nicely, bam, bam, right back up again. Okay? They tend to last between 15 seconds and a minute, but they go straight down and straight back up again. Okay? Um, and any deceleration that goes from baseline to nadir in less than 15 seconds is automatically by default or by definition a variable deceleration. Okay? And that's an important thing to understand, that it has an abrupt onset. Variable decelerations are caused by a sudden drop in pulse ox. Okay? And when would a baby get a sudden drop in pulse ox? When the cord is compressed. When the cord is compressed. Okay? So if you've got a cord in a funny place, it shuts off the oxygen to the baby, and all of a sudden it drops. And then it comes right back up again when they move. So it can happen with, during a contraction, where the... The cord is looped around his shoulder or something, and it contracts and it compresses that cord, okay? The most common is cord compression, where the cord's just in a bad place, and it contracts and it squeezes that cord, and it shuts down oxygen to the baby for a couple seconds, and then as soon as the contraction's over, it pops right back up again, okay? They're not a sign of harm or of, of illness. There's nothing wrong with the baby at all. It just means that they're in a bad spot, okay? And all we do is change mom's position and see if we can't get her off that cord, okay? Um, so they're, they're caused by cord compression. Oftentimes they happen during contractions, but they can happen anytime, and they are not associated with the timing of the contraction. Okay? And that's important because now we're going to talk about the bad one. The bad one is called a late deceleration. So if I've talked about an early uh, uh, if I've talked about early D cells being a visibly apparent gradual <coughs> onset, decrease of the fetal heart rate that goes that begins nadirs and ends with the beginning peak and end of the contraction. And I talk about a variable D, a D cell being a visibly apparent, acute onset, decrease in the fetal heart rate, not associated with contraction. What do you think a late D cell is? Go ahead. After the contraction happens, then the drop. Right. Go ahead. Give me the whole definition. You know it because I've already said it. You got it. You got it. It is a... No, you do. <laughs> visibly apparent, gradual onset, decrease in the fetal heart rate, that begins, nadirs, and ends after the contraction begins, peaks, and ends. Okay? So it's the whole contraction so, within the whole D-cell. So, no, no. So you've got your early D-cells are like so. One stacked on the other. A late D-cell shifts. Okay? The D-cell, the contraction starts, and then a few seconds later, the D-cell will come down. The contraction peaks, and then the D-cell and uh, nadirs after the peak of the contraction. It goes down, and then it starts to resolve, okay? So it's not entirely after, but it begins after the contraction begins. It naders after the contraction peaks, and it ends after the contraction ends. So it's just shifted to the right just a little bit. A late deceleration is a visibly apparent, gradual onset, Decrease in the fetal heart rate that begins, naders, and ends after the contraction begins, peaks, and ends. Okay? So early's come with the contractions. Variables come whenever. Late's come after. Okay? Early's are gradual onset. Variables are acute onset. Late's are gradual onset. You see a, you see a system here? Yes. Start to make sense? Now, late decelerations are a sign of badness. A late deceleration is a sign of placental, uh, placental insufficiency. A placenta is not able to give the baby the oxygen that they need. What happens when the contraction happens is the placenta gets squeezed and blood flow decreases to the baby. When the baby's healthy, he's like, I got this. I can hold my breath. Watch. <gasps> okay, no problem. Okay, and it doesn't affect him at all. When an early decel happens, he's going... <gasps> Oh, man, that hurts. Okay, all right, I'm fine. All right. When a variable happens, like, hey, what happened? Oh, okay, I'm all better. When a late diesel happens, he says, okay, here comes that contraction. Oh, 
oh, I'm so tired, I just can't do it. So he starts out okay, and he runs out of reserves halfway through the contraction, and his heart rate dips, okay? And it's an ominous sign. It's a sign of trouble. It's a sign that something is happening. You usually see late decelerations with a, mod, with a minimal or absent variability associated with it, okay? Everything slows down as he gets more sick. Does that mean C-section right away? Nope. No? Nope. Now, the important thing about fetal assessment is everything I just told you, most of the time it means absolutely nothing, okay? And the positive predictive value for a seat for, for fetal distress based on a category three tracing, which is a real bad tracing, is less than half a percent, okay? 99.5% of the time we run into a crash C-section, baby comes out kicking and screaming like there's nothing wrong. We're thinking this is a horrible, horrible, sick baby, and they come out going, gotcha, 99% of the time. Fetal heart rate monitoring is a wonderful predictor of wellness. It can tell us when a baby is really healthy, okay? We got moderate variability, we have spontaneous accelerations, no D cells, that's a baby who's happy, healthy, and it's almost always true. But the opposite is very rarely true, okay? The opposite, especially at the extreme, it just never happens. We have these horrible babies whose heart rate is down in the 60s for a minute or two or three or four minutes. We do a crash C-section, and as soon as we expose them to the oxygen, they go, <laughs> just kidding. And there's nothing wrong with them at all. Okay? It is not a very good tool. And the only thing that continuous electronic fetal monitoring has done is increase our C-section rate and has done nothing to help fetal outcomes. Nothing in 50 years. Okay. Do we still use it? Yep. Does every single woman get it? Yep. Is there much value to it? Not much. Okay. It can help us to kind of figure out what's going on. It can help us. We can make the fetal heart rate better if we do certain things. But don't hang your hat on your fetal heart rate. Okay. Now, the goal is to assess the, ox the adequacy of fetal oxygenation during labor. Yep. An adequately uh, oxygenated baby has moderate variability and accelerations and they're pretty darn happy. Okay. It is not to identify sick babies, and that's very important. It means it's healthy enough to continue. That's all we know from a fetal heart rate. Things are healthy enough to continue. When they start to go bad, might not be healthy enough to continue, we might have to pop that parachute. We just don't know, okay? But we know that the goal of fetal heart rate monitoring is to establish adequate oxygenation during labor, okay? Um, and it's important to understand the limitations and the physiology behind fetal heart rate monitoring, okay? Um, it, is, it is a screening tool like high blood pressure. If you have high blood pressure, it doesn't mean you need heart surgery, okay? It just means we need to figure out what else there is. This is our first line screening tool for, or one of our first line screening tools for adequacy of fetal oxygenation, okay? Um, it doesn't mean baby's sick. It just means something's not right. We don't know what it is. Okay? Um, and it's caused, so the, the, these changes in the heart rate are caused by A, the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, arguing between the two, trying to achieve homeostasis, and B, oxygenation. Inadequate oxygenation causes an increase in the parasympathetic nervous system, causes them to drop. Okay? Adequate oxygenation causes the two to maintain stability. Okay? Now, the NICHD nomenclature is what I was saying when I said visibly apparent, decrease, in, and it's in your book, okay? Now, I've actually already answered all of these. Oh, well, let's talk about what do we do. So, I need you to know table 12-6. I need you to look at it, I need you to read it, I need you to understand it, I need you to know it. Okay? And 448. That's two pages. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because this is a, a hallmark of nursing care in labor and delivery, is how to respond to fetal heart rate changes. Okay? So, early, early decelerations. Who can tell me what an early deceleration is? Uh -huh. Gradual onset. Decrease in the fetal heart rate. That that no, that begins, naters, and ends with the beginning, peak, and end of the contraction. 
It's not an accident that I'm saying it this way, okay? An early D cell is not a D cell that goes down with the contraction, okay? It's not. It is a visibly apparent, gradual onset, deceleration of the heartbeat that begins, naters, and ends with the beginning, peak, and end of the contraction. You need to be able to say that in your sleep, okay? I promise you, the question on the test is going to be define early D cell. Define variable D cell. Define late D cell. Okay? Uh huh. It's going to be a bonus question. But you will also see them as multiple choice questions as well. This baby's heart rate looks like, or is described as this. What kind of D cell is that? So this may be important. This is extremely <laughs> important. <laughs> this is several points on the test important. This is all anybody in your clinical setting cares about important. Okay? So, early D cells, which are visibly apparent, gradual onset, decrease in the fetal heart rate that begins, naters, and ends with the beginning, peak, and end of the contraction, are innocuous. They're a sign that things are coming, that you're about to have a baby, or maybe you've got a late, maybe you've got a baby in the posterior, but they're not harmful. They continue to be what's called a level one tracing or category one tracing, and we don't need to respond to early deceleration. There is no action, okay? Now there's variable deceleration. Variable decelerations are? Visibly apparent. Okay, actually the word is, I, I've said acute once or twice, but it's actually abrupt. Abrupt onset. If you said acute, it wouldn't, I, I'd give you credit for it. But it's actually abrupt onset. Decrease the fetal heart rate regardless, uh -huh. irregardless of the contraction. Perfect. And they happen randomly throughout depending on what's going on inside the uterus. And since we can't see what's going on inside the uterus, we don't know. We can't predict them. Okay? They do tend to happen during contractions just because that's when the cord is going to be squeezed the most. But I've literally had babies who I swear is hanging onto his kid's umbilical cord and just squeezing it for no good reason. To jump right the door. He's just like, eh, 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 you know, no big deal, right? <laughs> and jump right the door. like this, yeah. yeah. No. At the door! Yeah, right. Everybody ready? Yeah. Okay. So when you've got a variable deceleration, you want to take steps to avoid, to, to decrease that compression that's on the cord, okay? The best one is to just change mom's position. If the cord is over here and mom is lying on her right side and she's getting D cells, we roll her on her left side so that we get off the off the uh, off the cord. Yep. Or we sit her up, or we lie her down, or we move to one position or another, or we get out of bed, or whatever. Okay? We change positions until we figure out where the where it's not gonna compress the cord. Okay? But a variable D cell isn't harmful and it doesn't mean anything. Now, the trick is because psychology is what it is. The variable D cells tend to become more frequent, they tend to ha get longer and go deeper, and they tend to freak people out for no good reason, okay? So I try to avoid variable D cells just so I keep my doctors away, okay? Because they're annoying about those things, okay? Now, there are some really cool things we can do. We can put in a, a pressure catheter into the uterus and inflate the uterus with, more, uh, with normal saline and put more amniotic fluid in there, so to speak and that takes the pressure off the umbilical cord because it floats them up with water and now they're not lying on their cord anymore. You see a lot of variables after the water is broken just because there's no cushion on the cord anymore. Okay? So we can replace the water. That tends to work um, and that's okay. But um, sometimes people will give oxygen to somebody who's having variables and that's just laughable. That does absolutely nothing. Because okay? you can give her a, a thousand percent oxygen if you crip the cord, no oxygen's coming. Okay? And the baby's not hypoxic, okay? Mom is not hypoxic, it's just that the, the cord is in a bad spot, okay? Now there are late decelerations. Late decelerations are ominous. Late decelerations mean that there's a problem with the baby getting oxygen, okay? That there's something wrong with his scuba tank, so to speak. He can't get oxygen no matter what you do. He's not getting oxygen very well, okay? We start with position changes because maybe there's this weak placenta and he's having a cord compression, and the two of them together are just too much for him to handle. So we're going to make it a perfect uterine environment with position changes. We're going to give mom oxygen because if the placenta is not working very well, maybe we can push it up just enough so that it'll support baby without getting decelerations. Okay, we can support that placenta. Okay. Um, vaginal examination. Everyone loves to talk about vaginal exam. Okay. And I'm like, what the heck are you thinking? Okay. <laughs> vaginal exam isn't going to make the baby healthy all of a sudden. It's not going to make the placenta work better. 
But what is a vaginal exam going to tell you? How far dilated she is. And what does that matter? How much longer do we have to go before this baby's going to be born, right? Yeah. If this is a third time mom and she's nine centimeters and I got late D cells, no problem. Let's just start pushing. We'll have that baby in a few minutes and I don't have to worry about it. This is a first time mom at three centimeters. I got another 10 hours of this. It's only going to get worse as the baby gets put under more stress. So a vaginal exam tells me where I am in the labor process. It doesn't help the baby, it doesn't make the placenta work better. It just helps me plan how much of this can I tolerate before I need to do something else. It helps okay? the diagnosis. I, I suppose it would. And then palpation for tachycystole. What on earth is tachycystole? That's the Okay, what about contractions? They're going fast. There you go, fast contractions. Exactly, tachycystole. Well, I'll tell you, that medical terminology class, that helps every time, right? Fast muscle, fast muscle, fast muscle, right? Tachycystole is having more than five contractions in a 10-minute period, um, averaged over 30 minutes. So what hap why, do you, why does tachycystole matter? Because after the, doesn't that hurt the baby? Why does it hurt the baby? Okay, more important than squeezing the baby, what else is happening? Right, you're decreasing oxygenation to the baby, right? And so when they've got a 90 second contraction and 90 seconds or two minutes to rest after the contraction, they can do lots of reps, right? But if they're having 90 second contractions and 10 seconds rest and 90 second contractions, there's no recovery and they're gonna get tired and they're gonna start having these late decelerations. Can you say what it was again? More than Tachycystole, more than five contractions in a 10 minute period Averaged over 30 minutes. So what that means is once in a while, you're going to see six contractions in 10 minutes. That doesn't mean she has tachycystole. It has to be kind of persistent. So two out of three of your 30, 10 minute periods are greater than five. Over an hour. Over, over 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Yeah. So we take 10 minutes, we count six contractions. Take 10 minutes, we count four contractions. Take 10 minutes, we count, we got five contractions. She's not quite tachycystole. She's not averaging more than five in 10 minutes. Okay, or six or more, okay? But tachycystole definitely will cause late decelerations, right? And the uh, stop Pitocin, if she's on Pitocin and you have late decelerations and you don't stop the Pitocin, write your check, okay? Mm -hmm. Give away your car to that family because you are knowingly harming the baby and ignoring the fact that you have category three tracing, okay? Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> just you're giving money away. All right, you will be sued. I promise. Okay, so pitocin um, makes the uterus contract more frequently and makes the uterus contract harder. And so yes, it does cause tachycystole and it can cause problems. But even more, babies hate pitocin. Okay, there's something about pitocin that we haven't figured out yet, but it will make baby's heart rate deteriorate for no apparent reason. Okay. Understand, when I give a mom Pitocin, it travels through her bloodstream and right into the baby, okay? And it goes right into the baby and it affects the baby just like it's going to affect mommy, okay? And it's going to get in the baby's brain and it's going to cause problems with his parasympathetic nervous system, okay? And so babies hate Pitocin. So if we've got a baby who's struggling, having a hard time getting oxygen, and we continue to bang that Pitocin, we're just making it worse for baby and he's going to continue to deteriorate. We don't know why, we don't understand it, and most of your textbooks have it written very mechanically to say that Pitocin makes contractions, contractions are bad, contractions make babies hurt. I'm telling you, there's something else, okay? Because most of the time, we have category two tracings, we have babies who have late decelerations and they're on Pitocin, they're not having six or seven contractions every 10 minutes. They're just having normal contractions every two to three minutes, but for whatever reason, they can't tolerate normal labor as well, okay? And we don't know why. We don't know if it's because we use Pitocin for babies who are sick to induce them, and so they're already sick and we're just making them sicker, or is it that Pitocin made them sick in the first place and this helps them deteriorate? We don't know, okay? But we know that if you've got a late deceleration and you don't stop your Pitocin, you're begging for trouble, okay? You had better justify why, okay? And then correct maternal hypotension. I'm gonna tell you this, this, this is, is a, a a well-established fact in obstetrics. The baby is mom's pulse ox, okay? If there's anything wrong with mom's blood pressure, mom's ability to get oxygen, mom's fluid volume status, 
It's going to show in the baby before anything else. Okay? Your because what happens if your body is laboring, okay? Your body is pregnant, and all of a sudden your arm gets torn off. Your body now goes into survival mode. Bless you. Does your body care about your uterus? Absolutely not. If your arm gets torn off, your body cares about the heart and brains and nothing else, right? And so it shunts all the blood away from your non-vital organs right to the heart, okay? And so the kidneys and the uterus, they shut down. And the, the uterus is far more sensitive. The baby is far more sensitive than the kidneys, okay? You'll see that change immediately. The most common maternal hypotension that we see is immediately after an epidural, okay? Moms, we give them a bolus of fluid to boost up their, their circulatory system, and then we make them numb from the belly button down, and all of these big blood vessels go open up, and all the blood pressure drops as it falls into this relaxed vascular system. And mom's blood pressure will go from the 120s over 80s down to 60 over 30, and baby's heart rate immediately drops. And we'll see the heart rate drop before we can even take a, pull, a blood pressure, okay? We're like, whoa, what happened? Take her blood pressure. Oh, there it is. Blood pressure's dropped. So we immediately start to replace her, um, her fluid volume, give her more fluid, um, um, give her a medicine to make her, her, her vessels tighten up. It's called um, um, ephedrine. Ephedrine. We'll give them ephedrine, and it brings her heart rate back up again. Don't bother with the ephedrine nonsense. Just know <laughs> that if mom has any hypotension, she's going to start having late decelerations. She'll have profound, long-lasting decelerations. Okay? Uh, another time that mom's heart rate will drop, or mom's blood pressure will drop for no good reason, is when she's laying flat on her back. Remember we talked about that supine hypotension that comes along with, with constriction of the vena cava? Okay? Mom's sitting flat on her back, and her baby's heart rate takes a dive. Get her off her back. Correct her hypotension by moving her to one side or the other. That'll bring her blood pressure back up again. The decelerations will go away. Happens all the time. I come into labor and delivery, and there's a woman wearing oxygen flat on her back. And I go, what were you thinking? Why, nurse, did you give her oxygen and then put her in a position so she can't use her oxygen? <laughs> How about take the oxygen off and get her on her side, and then all of a sudden she can use her oxygen again? Okay? So get her off her back, get her, blood, get her blood pressure back up again, see what's going on, okay? Second stage of labor. Now, um, second stage of labor is defined as 10 centimeters to delivery. This is the pushing phase of labor. This is the time when we're really starting to move, okay? Um, moms will tend to feel an involuntary urge to push, and you'll hear it in their birth song. A woman will be laboring, uh, 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 oh, what was that? <laughs> uh, uh, okay. And you can hear it. You hear a little catch in their voice. Okay, and that's an involuntary push effort. Okay, and you can hear it in their birth song. When I'm sitting around doing my labor, sitting with my interns, and I'll sit up on the trash can, <laughs> holding my phone. Hmm? Did you say something, Mom? No? Okay. What was that, Mom? I don't know. I got this funny feeling. Oh, okay. <laughs> what was that, Mom? Oh, there's something in my butt. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> and every contraction, it gets a little bit more powerful. It gets a little bit more prominent. And they feel this incredible urge to have a bowel movement. And that's that involuntary push effort. And I mentioned this before. What is that reflex called? Ferguson. Ferguson's reflex. Exactly. You can literally elicit Ferguson's reflex by pushing on the back of someone's tail, on the, on the, cur the, the curve of someone's tailbone. Just reach your fingers in and push on it. And they'll be like, ah, what was that? <laughs> I do it when, when they won't push. And then I'm like, so you want to push? You got to push? You got to help? You gotta, here, watch. Do this. Follow my fingers. And they were like, ah, how did you do that? <laughs> Ferguson's reflex. Okay? And so you want to promote effective pushing. Okay? And everybody is a little bit differently. And there's some disagreement between closed glot glottis and open glottis pushing. Okay? Closed glottis pushing is what you see on TV. Okay, honey, you're gonna push, and I need you to push. You're gonna count. You're gonna push for ten seconds. You're gonna take a big deep breath. <gasps> <A di> <laughs> oh what happens to my face? Yes. You see me turn red and then go to purple. Uh -huh. What happens to baby when mom goes purple? Uh -huh. Baby goes purple because baby is mom's pulse ox, right? Mm -hmm. 
And so, and everyone in the room is going, I count, one, two, three. And I'm like, Jesus, would you shut up? <laughs> We're not at a football game, okay? You didn't just knock him out and you're like counting him out. <laughs> Ten, he's out. Yeah, the foam finger. <laughs> yeah. That's what I see. I see foam fingers and everyone's yelling and screaming. Is that conducive to a calm, beautiful environment? No, it's very mechanistic, very controlled, and it tends to cause problems. Now, understand, some people need that, okay? Some people have no idea what they're doing, and they have an epidural, and they have no natural sensations that help them push. And you say, push, and they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Push, <laughs> and I'm like, shut up. <laughs> All right, we're going to work through this together, okay? I'm going to have you take a deep breath like you're going underwater and push. So there is a use for closed glottis, controlled counted pushes, okay? And then there's open glottis pushing. Open glottis pushing is when you go, okay? Now, the difference between the two is when you're breathing out and pushing, can you push for 15 seconds? No, you run out of air, right? And all of a sudden you're like, whoo, whoo, I gotta take a breath again, okay? And that's on purpose. It increases mom's pulse ox, it increases baby's pulse ox, and baby's tolerated an awful lot better, okay? When you do that, mom will push for a couple seconds, take a deep breath, push for a couple seconds, take a deep breath, and that's very, um, very natural. That's what the body wants to do. It wants to keep mom and baby well oxygenated. And so pushing with an open glottis helps. And there are some studies that show that babies who are born with closed glottis pushing have a much lower PO2 at birth, that they take longer to get to APGARs of nine and nine, that they struggle more at birth because they're hypoxic, that you get more problems with fetal heart rate tracing. It's just a real pain in the butt, okay? And then the other one is you want to establish a position of comfort, okay? It doesn't matter what position she's in as long as she's comfortable. And we talked about the universal pushing position is in a squat, right? Mm -hmm. Either lying on your side, lying on your back, lying on your hands and knees, standing up and squatting at the side of the bed. All humans deliver in a squat or push in a squatting position. You just can't push effectively like this. <laughs> doesn't work. You need those legs up and pelvis open to make that happen, okay? I saw when you said they were standing, I was trying to yeah, figure they, out. Yeah, they do this, and then they squat, and then they stand up, and then they do it again, exactly. What is it they say? What is it they say? Mop the floor? Mop the floor with the baby. Now, I don't know why I put this here, but I'm glad that I got a chance to look at it again. So this is... So we talked about, I'm just going to show you real quick. So you see over here your early deceleration. See how they match? One stacks right on top of the other. Mm -hmm. What's really cool, the best fetal monitoring uh, uh, tool out there is a straight edge. I like to use my pen, okay? And I do this. Oh, there's the beginning of the contraction and the beginning of the decel. There's the peak of the contraction and the nadir of the decel. There's the end of the contraction and the end of the D cell. Looking pretty good. Okay? Variables can be anywhere. Okay? And then your lace. Here's the beginning of the contraction, but I don't have a D cell. Oh wait, there's the beginning of the D cell. Right at the right at the peak of the contraction. There's the nadir of the D cell. Look where it is on the contraction. See that? So a plain old simple straight edge will help you figure it out. When you're lining up your nadir with your D-cell like this, that ain't good. You see that? Yes. Okay? Your earlies are straight up and down, and your lates are shifted to the right. Okay? That just connected. Good. And variables can be anywhere. But you see also, see this gradual onset? Let me borrow this again. Yeah. I'm going to use this. See this gradual onset here? This is the beginning of the D-cell, and there's its nadir. You see how long that is? Okay, this isn't graduated, so I can't tell you how long it is, but that's probably about 45 seconds, okay? But look at this. The beginning of the D-cell to the, to the nadir is just 5 to 10 seconds. Same thing here. This one is straight down, okay? So these are variables. They are V-shaped, straight down, and they come back up immediately. Okay, they come back up quickly, because that's purely squeezing of the cord. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Now, the other thing I forgot to mention, and I'm not sure if we talked about it on the next slide or not. No, okay. The other thing I forgot to mention is there are three categories of tracing. Category one, category two, category three. Has anyone heard or read anything about category one, category two, category three? Your book gives very specific answers. A category one tracing means perfect, okay? A category one tracing has moderate variability, has Axel, or the axels are, are irrelevant in the category system. There's moderate variability and no decelerations, and the, the heart rate is within normal range, between 110 and 140, 150, or 160, okay? So category one means perfect. It's also like a unicorn. You hardly ever see category one tracings. There's always something wrong in labor, especially in second stage. Okay? So category one means everything is wonderful, we could do this for weeks, life is good. Category three, on the other hand, is we're at death's door. Things are horrible. We have minimal or absent variability. We have repetitive late decelerations nadering in the 60s. We have prolonged decelerations. A baby is, is sinusoidal. There's all kinds of stuff going crazy. Heart rate is in the hundred is in the, the 230s, 240s. Okay. It means we need an emergency C-section right now. Okay? You will always know when you see a category three tracing. Okay? They are holy cow. Yes. I'm sorry. Are you saying tracing? Tracing. tracing. Yeah. This is called a tracing. It's what the computer prints out on paper. Okay? Category three tracings are holy cow. Mm -hmm. If you ever write category three on any piece of paper, next to it should be, and so we transition to emergency birth, <laughs> okay? Meaning forceps delivery or C-section immediately. You never want to see in your documentation category three for 45 minutes, an hour and a half, mm -hmm. while we waited for the baby to die, okay? <laughs> Nobody wants to see that. Right. Category three is an emergency, and you very rarely see it, and when you see it, you respond to it immediately, okay? Now, the vast majority of curiosity and tracings obviously are what? Two. Category two, the one I haven't talked about yet, right? It's not that unicorn, everything is perfect. It's not that, oh my God, we're dying. It's right in the middle, and most tracings are category two. Category two is a, is a tracing with anything unusual, variables. Minimal or moderate, very minimal or absent variability, occasional late decelerations, fetal tachycardia, fetal bradycardia, persistent fetal bradycardia. You're, you're not in, in death's door. There's nothing, no one is dying, but something ain't right, and we can't figure out what it is. Okay? Most tracings are category two, and if you document category two, you have to then document what you did to try to make it better. Okay? So we got persistent late decelerations. We have a category two tracing. We turn down or off the Pitocin. We have persistent repetitive variable decelerations. Category two tracing. We change mom's position. Okay, that kind of thing. All right. So category one means no action. Everything is great. We're continuing on. Mm -hmm. Category two means something's not right. I'm going to take steps to fix it. Right. Category three means we're running for an emergency delivery, either abdominally or vaginally. Okay. <clears throat> Now, birth. We all saw the birth videos. We watched them last week. If you Google them, there are 400,000 birth videos that you can watch. And they, have to have, they tend to have a few things in common, okay? As the baby descends through the, through the birth canal, he's going to start bulging out the perineum. And if you watch a woman who's about to birth, give birth, before you see the head, you see the perineum bulge out, okay? And then as it bulges out, you start to see this little opening like this is like a curtain kind of opening, doors are opening, and the baby starts to come out through double doors, right? <laughs> so you got this bulging of the perineum. With the bulging is going to come a flattening, thinning of the perineum. You're going to notice, like if, uh, one of the videos that I put in the slides that you guys had, had the chance to watch, showed the perineum get incredibly thin and stretch out like a turtleneck. Remember that? Mm -hmm. That's a very thin, bulging, stretched out perineum, okay? You'll get an increased bloody show. That's really early. That's as they're, they're like eight, nine centimeters. And then you'll see the labia begin to separate. It starts to open a little bit, and you see the baby's head come, and that's called crowning, okay? When you can see the baby's head come. 
When you see that, somebody in the room probably needs a pair of gloves, okay? <laughs> Especially if this isn't her first baby. If this is her second or third baby, they crown for like 30 seconds, okay? And then they're having a baby, right? If it's their first, they'll crown for 30 minutes. It takes forever the first time, and that's okay. You want a long, slow process. Did one of the videos that I showed was it the Japanese actress who had a baby? Did I should see? Did, I, did you guys see that link? No. Okay, she crowned forever, didn't she? So like 10, 15 minutes of birth. What's that? Yeah, the, yeah, that midwife was very touchy. Uh, if I were in there, I'd be like, stop it, stop it. Put your hands in your pockets. What's wrong with you? Oh, was she doing that? Yeah, she was. She was pushing and stretching and washing and scrubbing and doing. Yeah. And he's like, stop! And I was like, yeah. I don't think I can watch. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it looked bad. Okay? So, as the birth is imminent, we move from its coming to here it is. Okay? It's going to happen any minute now. That's when you start to see crowning. Moms will experience a burning sensation, and that burning sensation is called? The ring. Fire. The ring of fire. <laughs> I always think of finding Nemo. Ring of fire! You told me you could do a ring of fire! <laughs> Okay, you think of Johnny Cash yes. going through the burning ring of fire? Okay, I find Nemo is far more dramatic. <laughs> so yeah, so and women have a universal response. I'm going to tear. I'm tearing. It is an incredible burn. Okay, now I've never had a baby and I don't earn a birth canal, but I have been constipated. Okay, and anyone who's ever been severely constipated knows the feeling. Well, you know you got a big boop, a big poop in there, a big bolus of stool, and you have this involuntary urge to push, and you're like, it hurts when I push, but I have to do it anyway, right? You're like, Ugh! oh man, that hurts, Ugh! and you push it out, and it burns like crazy, right? It is the exact same phenomenon, okay? It's a bolus of something pushing on Ferguson's reflex, coming through a tight orifice, okay? Now, I'm not saying it's the same intensity, but it is the same physiologic response. Okay, constipation and birth are extremely similar. One is just far more impressive. Okay, but when people say, "What's it like?" I say, "Well, it's a little bit like being really constipated." I hope the baby's more impressive than it. I would hope so, right? A large bolus. Oh, hard to A large bolus. Bolus can be impressive though. I can't recall my child's name. And a baby is a bolus, is it not? Yes. A large foreign body moving through a passageway. <laughs> but here's the interesting thing about this burning ring of fire is that is kind of Johnny Cash, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the impressive thing about this, whether they tear or don't tear, it feels exactly the same. Okay? A woman cannot tell if she's tearing or not tearing. Okay? They just feel the burn and they assume they're tearing most of the time. Okay? And you spend an awful lot of time going, it's okay. It doesn't matter whether you tear or not. One, I can't make you not tear. If I knew how to make you not tear, I'd be a billionaire. Okay? Because every woman in the world would come see me so she could deliver without any stitches. There are things we could do to make it better. But it's really kind of hard to predict what's going to happen. Okay? And two, it's got, it's got to happen. No one is in control of this. Push, don't push. You don't have, an, you don't have the option. Okay? Just get it over with. Push and, get, and be done, okay? Um, um, but that burning sensation is called the ring of fire. It's common on almost all women who are having babies in one degree or another, okay? Um, an intense pressure in the rectum, we've talked about that a hundred times. That's Ferguson's reflex. And then episiotomies are evil, evil. I have done seven episiotomies in my entire career and I never want to do number eight, okay? And I just don't do them. I've had it. I've had hundreds of opportunities, and I always say no. Okay. The whole time seven, you've only had seven. Seven. Wow. Yep. In about fifteen hundred births. That must have been bad. I thought. I thought you were yeah. so extreme. No. Nope. Like, nope. So episiotomy is the number one surgical procedure performed on women. Okay. And it used to be the indication for episiotomy was vaginal birth. The idea being that if I make the birth canal a little bit bigger, I can get the baby out faster, and I might be able to control the direction of the tear. Okay, um, what happens when you do an episiotomy is you take scissor blades and you crush the tissue between the scissor blades. All right, when you crush tissue, 
A crush injury is far worse than a tear injury, okay? A crushing <coughs> means that you violate the cell walls, they rupture, they release proteolytic enzymes. Proteolytic enzymes eat the tissue around in the reconstruction period and they form scar tissue, okay? That's what happens when you crush tissue. Now, a vaginal laceration coming from tearing is not crushing tissue. It's a little bit like putting your hand in a bucket of water. You separate the cells, but you don't damage the cell membrane themselves. The two cells just pull apart. And you've got that intracellular matrix that gets disrupted, but not everything else, okay? It just separates. And as soon as you take your hand out of the water, the cells come back together again, and the intracellular membrane starts to repair itself. It is a well-known phenomenon that if you cut an episiotomy, you increase your risk of third and fourth degree lacerations dramatically, okay? Um, my personal statistics, I have about a 50-50 uh, first degree tear rate in first time moms, okay? I have a 5% uh, second, third, or fourth degree tear rate among first time moms, okay? Very few of my mommies are gonna end up with a second or third or fourth degree tear rate, okay? But if I do an episiotomy, I automatically cut into the muscle and I automatically create a second degree tear. Every episiotomy is a second degree uh, uh, perineal laceration in the end. Um, and then they extend different. And the analogy that most people use is if you're trying to tear cloth, okay, you take a bed sheet or something and try to tear it, you can't. But if you make a little cut in the sheet and then pull, it tears really easy, right? The same thing happens in the perineum. Once you've disrupted the tissue by crushing those cells, you tear really easy. So most people do not do episiotomies anymore. And I love it when I get to walk in a room and I see this big telescoping birth canal like you saw on the TV, on the video, with this big stretching tissue and the head is all the way out, but the perineum is still wrapped around the baby's head. And the doctor will go, the intern always looks at me, think I need to help her out? You'll see that a lot. Watch in class. You'll see someone go, what do you think about helping her out? And when you're in labor and delivery, someone will do this while they say, talk about helping her. Okay. And that means I want to do an episiotomy. And my answer is no. Give me those scissors. Mine. <laughs> and I go, just watch. And so it happened not too long ago with Dr. Malsby. Uh, he was like, I, I think I need to help her out there, Tom. No, you don't. Watch. You just go nice and slow here. And I go, I went up and whispered into her ear about being calm and relaxed. Breathe a little. Now give me a nice gentle push. And the baby slid out and she had no, no tear at all. And most of the time, that's what happens. I want to do an episiotomy, but I don't, and I end up with no tear. And I go, ta-da! Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes you get horrible lacerations, and I've done everything I can to make it better, but it happens anyway. Okay? Now, there are two types of episiotomies. Both of them are evil, midline and medial lateral. <laughs> Any idea of the difference between a midline and a medial lateral episiotomy? It's so the midline so that I close the rectum directly. Goes straight down. Yeah. Yep, it's right in the middle. And a medial lateral? goes to the angle, right? They tend to be like, they go down and then out, okay? Or they just go straight out. Anyone know the difference? So a midline episiotomy goes straight down, closer to the, closer to the anus, right? Yeah. And what are you more likely to do with a midline episiotomy? It's a uh, recovery very really long time, and a patient cannot go to the bathroom for a while. Okay. But if you're cutting toward the anus, what's, what's more likely to happen? Infection. That it's going to tear into the anus. Okay, and, and disrupt the anal capsule because you're damaging the tissue leading to the anus. Okay, where, and now, because that's a very thin piece of tissue, it's really stretched out, it, it heals really well in that it heals quickly, usually with very little infection. Not as well as a natural laceration, but much better than a medial lateral uh, episiotomy. Medial lateral, you actually cut into the bulbo cavernosus muscles of the perineum and go out to the side. Yeah, you go out, well, usually it's just in one direction. We don't usually go in both directions. When you see it drawn, they have it in both directions. They're saying you can go right or left. Okay, but it's only helps. one cut, okay? But it disrupts the muscles of the perineum. And it takes a long time to heal. It gets infected more often. And it's much, much more painful, okay? Both of them are evil. Both of them happen because men don't have babies. And they don't think there's anything wrong with cutting the perineum, okay? Evil stuff. So when would, as you said, you did it like seven times or whatever, mm -hmm. but what's, what are the indications that you Usually it's a bad shoulder dystocia, oh, where okay. I've done my, my initial maneuvers and I need more room and I'll cut an episiotomy. Um, the one that, uh, um, that, uh, that, that like, 
And, and when I was early, if you look at my, my birth logs, the first 200 births, most of my episiotomies were there. And then I realized I was wasting my time and I stopped doing it. When I say like I've done seven in my career, the last one was in 2007. <laughs> the first seven, six of them were in 2005 and six. Okay, and the last time I did one was 2007. I, mean, I just stopped doing it. I was talking to my chief of midwifery and I talked about this incredibly difficult birth that I had just finished and I was tired and it was the end of the day and I talked about cutting an episiotomy and she said, why? Why did you cut an episiotomy? Well, so now you just need a little, what do you mean you need more room? If you need more room, don't you think the perineum is going to give it to you? Well, yeah, but I was hoping to what? You're hoping to what? Not have a laceration? You made the laceration. And so that talk was the end of it. I never did another piece <laughs> after that. Yes, ma'am. So when um, a laceration actually occurs, mm -hmm. do you stitch mm -hmm. the patient back up? Yep. Yep. You put them back together. You reapproximate the tissues kind of loosely, and they heal themselves. Mm -hmm. okay. Midwives do an awful lot of sewing. We always joke in midwifery that I can't sew unless it's bleeding and moving. <laughs> All right. Three o'clock time for break. Almost on your side. We start talking about PCM.